Notice that meditation instructions always tell you what to do. Even the ones that say to simply be with whatever comes up, that's an instruction of what to do. To be non-reactive, to be one with things. That's always a doing. This relates to the fact that meditation is a kind of activity, it's a kind of karma. And if you understand it as karma, as with all the Buddhist teachings, if you understand it, these things in terms of karma, you really understand them a lot better than if you try to take them without karma. It's a very popular tendency in modern Buddhism to want to have the Dharma without karma. In other words, to explain morality, explain meditation, to explain all aspects of Buddhist practice without reference to karma. But then you find there are these big holes, and so they take other teachings and stuff them in. Interconnectedness suddenly becomes the basis for our morality. A sense of no separate self becomes our goal. None of this has anything to do with what the Buddha taught. He taught, as he said, action of different kinds. But particularly he taught the action that leads to the end of action, or the karma that leads to the end of karma. And karma here has both meanings in terms of the action that's done and the results. We're looking for something that's beyond action, but to get there you have to do actions. And among the important actions, of course, are learning how to train your mind to be still and learn how to find where your clingings and attachments are and to let go of them. As for what you're going to find when you've let go of all your clingings, the Buddha gives just a few indications. We know that it is a state of ultimate happiness, ultimate freedom. It lies beyond the six senses. In other words, you don't know it through the eyes or the ears or the nose or the tongue or the body, or even through your regular consciousness that's aware of the six senses. It's something outside of that entirely. It's pretty much all he says. What he talks a lot about is how to get there, and that's where the action's coming. So right now, what are you doing? You should be focusing on your breath, or any other of the meditation topics that keeps you right here in the present moment. If you're with the breath, the breath itself is a kind of activity. Even though the body would breathe on its own, say, when you're asleep, the fact that you're alert and watching it means that you're automatically going to start fiddling with the breath. So fiddle well. In other words, try to figure out what way of breathing right now is going to be most satisfying for the body, most satisfying for the mind. Can you breathe in a way that nourishes all the nerves? Think of the breath energy. And of course, thinking of the breath energy here is another kind of action. It's a perception, they say. Perceive the breath energy coming in and out the pores, nourishing all the nerves, nourishing all the blood vessels. Breathing in with a sense of fullness, breathing out with a sense of total relaxation. Relaxation of the body. Don't totally relax your mind. You have to be alert. You have to be on top of this. That's an important distinction. When we focus on parts of the body, we tend to tense them up. So you've got to learn a new skill. Learn how to focus on something at the same time, relaxing it. Find some part of the body that it's easy to think, relax, and the body responds. Then when you get used to that, you can start moving to other parts of the body, areas where you tend to hold more attention. Think of it. Can you focus on that and relax it at the same time? That's an important skill, a skill that helps you stay with the body without putting too much undue pressure on different parts of the body. So you can stay here longer and longer, and this way you get to see your mind in action, where its intentions are, what counts as an intention. The kind of karma you're going to be encountering as you meditate is of three kinds. It would be the results of past actions coming in. And that can be anything from pains you may feel in the body to habits you have of thinking. 
And if you've been meditating, okay, some of the skills you've picked up from your past meditation should be coming in to help. Then there are your present intentions, and there are the results of your present intentions. You want to learn to read those two very carefully. Because when the Buddha is talking about the causes for suffering, it's in the present intentions. The fact that things are coming in from the past, good or bad, those aren't causing suffering. It's what your mind does with them in the present. So you look, again, you're looking at the mind in action. Your meditation is a form of karma, and at the same time it allows you to look directly at karma as you're doing it. And you begin to see where the ways you intend to focus on the breath are helping and other ways of focusing on the breath are not. And sometimes something will come in from the past, and one part of you in the present will say, I want to go with that, and it just takes off. Like someone who's supposed to be married and suddenly somebody shows up and they run off. I'll come back. Those people who encourage you to run off, they don't have any real concern for you. It's like Vronsky and Anna Karenina. The only difference being here is that the object you should be married with right now is something really good for you. So stay right here. Learn to be comfortable right here. comfortable in noticing what you're doing and having a sense that you're doing it well. This is going to take time. And as with any skill, you have to learn how to encourage yourself on the one hand and be very meticulous about judging yourself on the other. In other words, judging yourself not with the purpose of making yourself feel bad about mistakes, but judging yourself just so you notice, I did this mistake. What can I do to do it differently? Again, look at this as a kind of action. Don't think about what kind of person you are or who you are right now. Just think about what you're doing and what you could do better. This applies to everything. We're talking today about the, the question of having a sense of self and when things get very tenuous in the mind, very refined, you suddenly realize you have a strong sense of self in there. You have to tell yourself you want to let it go and there's a lot of resistance. You feel like you would have nothing if you didn't have a sense of self. Well, the way to get around that fear of nothing is not even to think about what your self is. What your self is is something, an issue that the Buddha put aside. He was asked point blank, do you have a self? Do you not have a self? Do we have a self? Is there a self? Is there no self? He didn't answer. He also said the questions of do I have a self? Do I have no self? Those should be put aside in general, across the board. What he does have you focus on is, what am I doing right now? Is it skillful? What are the act actions I'm doing? What are the results I'm getting? Do the things I do raise the level of stress and suffering in the mind, or do they lower it? If they're raising it, what can I do to change it? If they're lowering it, what can I do to keep on doing those lowering things so I can get more sensitive to even more subtle levels of stress? And then you look again, what am I doing to create those? It's all about action and result. Even the teachings on emptiness and the original teachings on emptiness are all about action and result. You look at your state of mind and you realize, okay, sitting here right now, it's empty of a lot of the concerns I had when I was at home, and empty of a lot of the other concerns I could be carrying around right now. But is there some, still something here that's not empty of disturbance? And you may say, oh, just the way I'm focusing here, or something I'm holding in mind, and that's disturbing, we'll let that go. And then appreciate the sense of emptiness that arises, empty of disturbance, that arises when you let that go. So it's all about action. And you begin to realize that when a sense of self comes up, you see it as not so much what you are, it's just a sense, it's an action, and there's some stress that goes with that. What would happen if you drop that? You're suspending the question of whether there's something behind all this or not, 
but you are looking at what you're doing and figure out what can I do to do it better. That way you get the whole issue of clinging to the sense of self, not through the idea of self, but through your sensitivity to your actions. You take it on from the side that way, and you find the mind is a lot more willing to let go. And it's through the letting go that there's release. So it's all about action. When you see suffering as a kind of action, and you see the causes of suffering as kinds of action, and the things you could do to do differently, to put an end to that suffering as kinds of action, everything that people talk about, they talk about interconnectedness. Well, we're connected through our actions. We're not connected through anything else. And what kind of connections do we have? It's not something we are born with, aside from the results of past actions. These connections are created right now as we're acting. So act well, so the connections are good, as long as you need connections. But ultimately you find the mind is a lot better off without connections to anything at all. So again, you look at your actions. When you learn to interpret the Buddha's teachings all in the context of how they relate to action, you understand them a lot better, where he's coming from and what the teachings are supposed to do. The Dharma is connected with action. The Four Noble Truths have their duties. And the meaning of the Dharma, the word atta, A-T-T-H-A, is often paired in Thailand with the word Dharma. And it means meaning, what the Dharma means, but it also means what its, its use is, what its purpose is, what the profit of it is. The Dharma itself means action in some context. And the Atta is where this is supposed to take you when you act properly. So if any question comes up in your meditation or you're reading, ask yourself, how does this relate to action? And that'll cut away a lot of the confusion. that would otherwise grow up around the Dharma and get in your way. <laughs>